Now, this is one of those messages. It's different. You may have never heard anything quite like it. It's different. Um, it's needed. It's a, it is a cautionary message. I want everybody to hear me. The time that's coming toward us over the horizon is going to bring so many changes. I was praying last year one day, and I heard the Lord speak to me as I was praying, and he said, son, he said, heaven is ready for my coming. And he said, hell is also ready for my coming. The only thing that's not ready is the church. That's what the Lord said to me. He said, the church is not ready. So tonight, <clears throat> I'm going to take my time. I'm going to walk through this. I want to get right into it. I'm going to read just one passage of Scripture in two different versions. It says in Luke 21 and 26, the King James Version, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. That's the famous, the infamous chapter, Luke 21, when the disciples said, what is the sign of your coming? And what is the sign of the end of the age? In Luke, it's chapter 21. In Matthew, it's chapter 24. In Luke 21, in the New Living Translation, it says people will be terrified at what they see coming upon the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. There's no doubt that I'm coming to you with a real strong message, and I'm convinced, convinced that the Holy Spirit has burdened me to share these things with you and to try to help you in every way that I possibly can as a human being to help you to be ready for what lies ahead for humanity, not just America, but humanity. When you hear some of the things that I'm going to say, you'll probably say, well, boy, he's really out there. And coming from me, and you know I don't usually deal with that kind of stuff, those of you that know me and you have a history with me, you know that I'm never out there like that. I'm just not. I only preach what I can prove in the Bible. And tonight, I'm going to preach some things that really sounds really out there, but I wouldn't dare preach it unless I could back it up with Scripture. So that's what I'm going to do. But as you continue to listen to me tonight, you're going to realize that I haven't covered anything at all that's not in your Bible. I'm bringing these things to your attention because the time is approaching very fast now when you'll begin to see these things coming at you and beginning to materialize. It's going to be such a time that you'll need to know what you can do about it, how to be prepared as a family, how to get your children and grandchildren prepared for it, the times that are right before us are not only important to know about, but as I said, you need to be ready as a parent and a grandparent to know how to talk to your children and grandchildren about the things that's going to be happening and coming, and you're going to need to be able to give them an answer. As a parent, as a grandparent, you're going to have to be equipped to know what to say, how to say it where to take them in the Bible and bring peace to your children and grandchildren because those times are right at the door. So I want to get started. I want to go first of all to the temptation in the Garden of Eden. <clears throat> I was praying last year and I got up early one morning and I was praying and I saw something that I can't figure out why I've never seen it before. Maybe I saw it, but I didn't think about it. It didn't really dawn on me. And as I've been praying about this message, the Lord took me back to this and reminded me of it. And the Lord said, I want you to talk to the people and tell them and help them to understand there was much more going on in the Garden of Eden than what meets the eye. Much more. As a matter of fact, it was so serious I really sort of dread to tell you how serious it was, and I sort of dread to tell you that the Lord didn't tell Adam and Eve what was coming. He only said, don't touch the tree. But I want to show you right now, and this is going to set our precedence for where I'm going. 
I've been looking back at beginnings, especially in the book of beginnings, which is the Genesis, the Genesis of all things. Moses wrote the book of Genesis, although he wasn't there. God gave it to him by revelation. Nobody was there when everything was created. Nobody was there in the garden before God created Adam and Eve. Moses gave us all the information by revelation. But whenever I read this, it was really a fresh revelation to me. And it sort of, I, t I have to be honest with you and tell you, when I saw it, it, it sort of really shook me. And I hope it shakes you because it's going to show you the seriousness of the hour. I begin to look at the first temptation in a completely different perspective. The Bible said the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat. And the only thing he said was, listen, the only thing, the only warning that God gave Adam and Eve was this. It sounds so tepid. Knowing what I know now and looking back at this, it sounds almost casual. He said, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. That's all he said. And he said, in the day that you do, you will surely die. That's all he said. That's all he said. That's all I've ever read. That's all I've ever preached. I talked about the serpent. But boy, was I taken back when I saw the serpent. Oh, my God. Here's some very important things to consider. When God said to Adam and Eve in the garden, he said, you may eat of all the trees, but this one right here, you see it? This one right here, this one. Don't eat of it. If you do, you're going to die. That was all he said. God never gave them details about the temptation that was coming. He never told them about the, uh, the details of the temptation. He only commanded them to eat, not eat of that one tree. That's all he said. God never shared that they would encounter a serpent-like creature that would enter into the picture and talk to them. The Bible says, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, the serpent did, yea, hath God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. What if that serpent in the garden was more than a snake? When we think of the garden Eden, that's sort of what we have in our mind right there, a snake. And it's a tree, it's a tree that has fruit on it. It was not an apple tree. It was a tree that bore fruit, and the Lord said, don't eat from it. In the day that you do, you'll die. It was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and there's a snake there, but that snake there is almost cartoonish compared to the one I want to describe to you. That snake right there, all it is is a reptile-looking thing. It's almost like a, a benign cartoon figure. What if it was not a member of the animal kingdom. Let me ask you a question. You remember God brought everything before Adam and he told him to name him. Every animal, God brought everything before him. Adam named all the animals and he had dominion over every one of them. But when this snake came in the garden, this was not a snake that Adam had named. What if this was more than a snake? I'm going to go ahead and use the word right up front, and I don't plan on using this word much. But what if that serpent was not of this earth? That meant it's an alien. Now, I know that hits your broadside right there. Just want you to listen to me for a minute and hear me. When I first heard this, the Lord said this to me. I had to do a double take, and since I see it now, I can't see it any other way. Here's what the Lord said. He said, this is not some kind of little snake coiled up in a tree, a green snake talking with a mouth about that big, and he's talking to Adam and Eve in the garden. No, 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 this is not that. An alien defined by Webster 
It says belonging or relating to another person, place, or thing coming from another world. Now, you know as well as I do, let's be honest, you know as well as I do that that snake in the garden was not a snake. He had the form of a snake, but it was not a snake. He was Satan. Okay, now listen to me carefully. Satan was not of this earth. He was from another world. Only thing the Lord said to Adam and Eve was, don't eat of this tree in the day you do, you'll die. But he never told them of a very powerful reptile that was full of lights and shine, a reptilian type figure that had a mesmerizing voice, a mesmerizing presence, luminous, shining, deceptive, interdimensional, and a fallen archangel. And that being was not of this terrestrial world. He came in the garden with Adam and Eve and he was a alien. And I want you to go ahead and receive that right now. And let me tell you who he was. In other words, when I say he was an alien, I'm not talking about a spaceship alien. I'm not talking about he came in a UFO. Now don't go out and quote me like that. <laughs> Amen. I'll ask the Lord to fill your bed with lice tonight. Amen. <laughs> but I'm using the word alien in the way that he was not of this world. Now, let me explain something to you before I go on. I need to just do this real quickly. When Jesus came, Jesus came by the way of human birth. He was born of a virgin. She gave him the body. The Holy Spirit gave him the supernatural seed. The blood that ran through his veins in his natural body was the blood that's the only detergent known to mankind to wipe away and to remit the sins of the world. Jesus picked up a body. It came through Mary. The Holy Spirit impregnated her. Satan never picked up a human body. If you have a body in the earth, you have authority. You can get a social security card. You can get a driver's license. You can get all kinds of benefits, welfare and different things. If you have a body, when Satan came, he never picked up a body. The Bible said, he that cometh in some other way is a thief and a robber. And Satan came in not through the door of human birth, but Satan came in as an interloper. He was an interloper. He was an alien from another world that popped up in the garden. They had no heads up. All they had was, don't eat of this tree, but they never was warned, there's an interloper gonna come in, he's bright and shiny, he's gonna talk to you, and you're gonna have to be really careful not to be deceived. Watch this. The Hebrew word for snake, snake or serpent is the Hebrew word, nakash. It's the Hebrew word nakash. It's the Hebrew word, a root. It is the basis of a noun. It has a noun connection, which means serpent. It has a verb connection, and that means deceiver or diviner with divine knowledge. Also is an adjective connection, and it means a bronze or brazen with a shine. Please listen to this. The serpent that came into the garden was not a snake. It was an alien, an interloper from another world. It was not a reptile like a rattlesnake or a black snake or a green snake or a garden snake. It was not that. Get that out of your mind. It was an interloper. Therefore, because in the Hebrew it means 
Serpent, it means diviner with divine knowledge. It means bronze or brazen. Let me give you a good example of a scripture in Ezekiel 28. It says in Ezekiel 28, thou hast been in the Eden. Thou hast been in Eden. Look there, it says it right there. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Is that right? Yes, he was. Well, what does he look like? Every precious stone was your covering. The sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, onyx, and jasper, the sapphire, emerald, and the carbuncle, and the gold. Wait just a minute. Let's wait just a minute here. Adam and Eve, minding their own business, that all the Lord said was, don't touch this, don't, don't eat this tree. All of a sudden, here's this being there, shines like bronze. He's a serpent. He has intelligence. He's able to talk. He's not crawling on his belly. He's got every precious stone as his covering. He's got topaz, sardis, diamond, barrel, onyx, jasper, all these things, and he is a knockout. He's from another world, but he is mesmerizing. And when he opened his mouth, his mouth was connected to tabrets and pipes, a connection of a network of tabrets and pipes on the inside of him. And when he opened his mouth, he had a voice that was absolutely sorcery voice, witchcraft voice. And when he talked... It went inside and captured your mind. And the Bible says, you were in the Garden of Eden. That's the snake that Adam and Eve saw and that Eve talked to in the Garden of Eden. That's him. You were in the garden. And every precious stone was your covering. In other words, this is not a snake with some kind of a snake hide that a snake crawls out of. No, 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 no. This was a intelligent, beautiful, just unbelievable alien. It's like, wow. And Isaiah 14, 12 says, how are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? You cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations. The Bible says further in Ezekiel 28, it says, you were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created until iniquity was found in you. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. See, the Bible says that he was beautiful. The snake was beautiful. The snake was not long and cylindrical like that. He was not cylindrical and long. He was, he was just magnificent in every way. It said, he was perfect in all ways till your heart was lifted up because of your beauty and you corrupted your wisdom by reason of your brightness. And God said, I'll lay you before kings and that they may really behold you. So in the garden, the shining one began his presentation to Adam and Eve as beautiful, shining, sparkling, the most expensive of stones and bronze coverings that look like gold. He used his beauty, his speech, and his seductive powers to deceive Adam and Eve. You might think, well, it's just not fair. It seems so unfair. I want to tell you something. Listen to me. This is why I'm here before you right now. The Lord never told them anything about this. All the Lord said was, don't eat of this tree. I'm trying to tell you the Lord told us in the last days that there's going to come deception like you can't believe. And I'm reminding you, he did not give us details, but I'm here tonight to tell you, wake up. Wake up. I'm telling you there's things that's coming. There's things that's coming that will absolutely shock the nations of the earth. And they're coming soon. And the Lord only said, don't eat of this tree. But he never told him about this beautiful creature. Why not? He chose not to. Listen, I think God's trying to tell us, you're going to have to listen to me and you're going to have to believe me, but I'm not going to give you details. (laughs) 
So, this shining thing in the garden was after world domination, and this creature was so smart that he knew Adam had that world domination because God gave it to him. And this creature wanted world domination, had world domination on his mind. And so he started the temptation with world domination in the back of his mind as his goal. He used his beauty, his speech, and his seductive powers to deceive Adam and Eve into forfeiting their authority to him by stepping outside the parameters that God had established. Okay, now I want to show you something else. This is so interesting. Now hear me. Y'all got to hear me whenever I say this. You got to hear me. Please hear me. Three chapters later, only three chapters later, after Eve bit that fruit and handed it to her husband with her in the garden, they bit that fruit and death set in. The earth was cursed. The humanity was cursed, a curse that would be transferable to future generations. The soil, everything, all cursed. But when that spirit that alien spirit from another world that didn't come here and pick up a body, an interloper, when he finally deceived them into eating that, I want to tell you something about sin. When you bite into what the devil is offering you, it's not just for that day, it's for your children and your children's children. And it's for future generations. Because let me show you what happened. Look at this. It came to pass, this is only three chapters later. Three chapters later. Now men begin to multiply on the earth. It's only three chapters later. It said, and daughters were born unto men, the sons of God, the fallen sons of God. Let's stop right there. When that beautiful devil said to Eve, and to Adam, oh, it's going to be fine. And he got them to bite into that fruit. When they bit into the fruit, they were, they were biting into a demonic, satanic structure that would affect millennia to come. And all of a sudden, wow, look at this. Men begin to multiply on the earth, and the Bible says that the angels, they were not born on the earth. They were also interlopers. Say what you want to. Make fun of me. Go ahead, make fun of me. Laugh at me. I'm trying to tell you right now, they were aliens. And you better hear me. Laugh at me. That's okay. But when the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, those fallen sons of God was not born on this earth. They were aliens from another place. And because they yielded to Satan in the garden, now they also didn't realize when they yielded to Satan that Satan now was going to allow his fallen angels to come and see the daughters of men and they were going to come down and begin to have sex with the women. And when they began to have the sex with the women, Nephilims were born. Giants spring forth, a race of giants spring forth. The Bible said the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. They took them wives of all which they chose. The Lord said, when the Lord said this, he said, my spirit will not always strive with man. He saw what was going on. He saw these alien fallen demons now taking the sweet female children of the people on the earth and copulating with them, having sexual intercourse with them. And God saw it and he said, my spirit shall not always strive with man. It upset God. And he said, for he is also flesh. His days shall be 120 years. 
There were giants in the earth in those days. And after that, the sons of God came into the daughters of men. They bare children unto them. The same became mighty men of old, which were men of renown. God saw the wickedness of man that was great in the earth. Every imagination of the thoughts of, of the heart was only evil continually. When this all started happening and these aliens started having sex with the daughters of men, it so changed the atmosphere of the earth that God said, I'm sorry I ever created man. It grieved the Lord at his heart. And the Lord said, I'm going to destroy man whom I've made from the face of the earth. I'm going to destroy him and the beast, everything that creeps and everything that flies. It repents me that I've made them. Sometime you just don't realize, friend, please hear me. The devil wants you to downplay sin. You don't really realize what you're doing when you're playing with sin, playing with the devil. Because Adam and Eve opened up the door to when mankind began to reproduce on the earth. They opened up the door to humanity from these alien spirits. And now these alien spirits is having sex with the daughters of men. And now it's causing God to repent that he even made man. But I want to show you something that's really interesting. It says in Genesis 6 and 9, these are the generations of Noah. It said, Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. Let's just stop right there just for a minute. I want you to look at something. It didn't say, it said Noah was a just man, but look at what it says as an addendum to that. It says he was perfect in his generations. Well, you know what that means is? He was one of the few DNAs left on the face of the earth that wasn't polluted by demon spirits. He was one of the few that had a, a, a wholesome, undefiled DNA. And God's eyes is going over the earth. He's looking over the earth. Mankind's proliferating. Sons of God's having daughters, sex with daughters of men. Giants is erupting. Those giants are now having sex with others, and they're proliferating. Not only the fallen sons of God now, but the giants are having sex with the daughters of men. And everything got so out of order that God said, it repents me that I've done this. So God looked over the face of the earth and he found a man by the name of Noah and look what it says. It says he was just man. In other words, he was good. He feared God. But the thing, the reason why God chose him was he was perfect in his generations. His, his DNA was not polluted and defiled yet by demons. And Noah walked with God. And here's what God said to him. Look at, look at me, everybody, and listen carefully. God said, build a boat. And God never told him to build a boat big enough for all the earth. He never told him, told him to build a, boat, build a boat big enough for a thousand people. He never told him to build a boat big enough for a hundred people. He never told him to build a boat big enough for 50 people. He gave him the dimensions from the beginning and said, only build a boat for two of all the animals and eight human beings. Why eight? Because that was some of the few remaining on the earth that had not been defiled. God was that close to wiping out everything on the earth, everything, just everything. But he found Noah perfect in his generations, and God said, I'm going to put you on a boat. It's going to rain for 40 days and 40 nights. It's going to destroy every human. It's going to destroy every beast. It's going to destroy every bird. It's going to destroy every animal. Only eight humans will be left, and I'm going to start over. It shows you the warfare and the hatred that there is of Satan against God. It shows you the level of hatred. It shows you the level of, I'll get you, I'll get back at you. Because God kicked Satan out of heaven. And Satan came down here and he said, I'm going to defile your people so badly that you want to trash them. And it has been a battle royal. And could I tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, right here in 2021, that battle is not subsiding. It's about to heat up. And that's what I'm doing here tonight. I'm trying to get in your mind and I'm trying to get in your head and get you thinking differently about some things. Because as surely as I stand here, 
It's coming. So God started all over again. This is just a quick history of the first deception that devastated mankind. You can see from the devil's first entrance into God's plan, Satan had an elaborate plan, he had a strategic plan, and he was successful. He got in as an alien. He corrupted an innocent couple that was pure and holy and no sin. He corrupted them. And not only did that, but when mankind began to proliferate on the earth, his fallen sons of God saw the daughters of men and they came in and helped themselves to the fair females of the earth and corrupted human seed. It's that serious. Now I'm going somewhere, just stay with me. So let me back up just a minute and say this one more time. That little thing in the garden that you've always thought about, put that picture back up there again. That little thing that you saw in the garden, ha, that's laughable. That's cartoonish. There's nothing to that. That's, that's cartoonish. Don't even look at it. What I've been describing to you, that looks like that's nothing. It's zero. What happened in that garden was extremely serious. And all God said was, don't eat of the tree. He never told him about what was coming, what it was going to look like. Never told him none of that stuff. Wake up. Watch this. So in the end times, we're not just talking about one serpentine type creature in the garden, but in our time, it is going to ramp up and make the garden look like a child's Sunday school picnic. You better hear me. The world doesn't even know it right now but the world is being prepared by a spirit that came in with COVID and the world is being prepared to receive the advent of the Antichrist and the false prophet. And don't kid yourself, it won't be a serpent this time with lights all over him and stones all over him. This is going to be the devil incarnate himself. This is going to be the devil's son. God had a son, his only begotten son. The Antichrist will be Satan incarnate. And that guy is alive somewhere, no doubt in my mind, he's alive somewhere right now. And conditions in the world are getting right. You can see that they're clabbering and they're working their way. And it's getting ready for the advent of the Antichrist and the false prophet. And nobody's talking about it. You know what the Lord said to me? He said, heaven's ready for the coming of the sun. And he said, hell is even ready for the coming of the sun. But the church is sound asleep. You may say, Brother Kilpatrick, you seem a little intense. You don't know how intense I am. I can't hardly sleep. I am very intense. Because I see, God's shown me, I can see what's coming. And what so disturbs me is when I get up and preach week after week after week and I look in the faces of people and they're yawning and they're thinking about where they're going to go eat afterwards. Wake up! Wake up! Come away! I wish I had some kind of a spiritual smelling salts to put under your nose and to bring you to reality. That's where we are. It's not time for the church to be asleep. It's high time to awake and begin to preach the word like we've never preached it before. So there's going to be an antichrist, which will be Satan himself, the devil incarnate. There will be a false prophet. He will be a false religious prophet, false religious leader, heading up a false religious system. I want to ask this question. Do you have what it takes to warn your children and grandchildren not to take the mark of the beast if we're left here? Is it even on your mind to talk to them? 
Do you have it in you to tell your children and grandchildren to not fall for this evil religion that's already at work in the world right now? That's accepting of everything. You see, what's happening right now is the world has gotten to the place that everything that we're, they're accepting, we stand against. And everything we stand against, they're accepting. We don't belong here. That's why the Lord's going to come and get us and take us out of here. Come on, give him praise. You've got an entire globalist system, world system. It's a globalist world system that right now is working against the church and working against Christ and God's plan. I want to show you something. So now, as I read you these scriptures, I think you're going to see what I'm seeing. And I believe it'll affect you the same way it affected me. Because now, since God's given me this revelation, if I can share it with you and you can see what I see, you're going to react, react like I have. Yeah. Let me show you something. Watch this. Revelation 16. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its waters dried up to prepare the way for the kings of China, kings of the east, China, to come up the dried up Euphrates River. They're going to march into the Middle East, getting ready for Armageddon. I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast, that is the false prophet, the dragon is Satan, the beast is the Antichrist, the false prophet is the false prophet, and I saw coming out of their mouth three unclean spirits like frogs. Stop right there just for a minute. Right now while I'm up here talking, there are strategies in heaven that God is implementing, even while I'm here talking, if he's not implementing them right now, he's about to implement them. And Satan is about to implement some strategies because Satan is not going to let God get any advantage. God's not going to let the devil gain the advantage. We're going to be caught in between a major frictional war of things that you're going to begin to experience and see. And I just don't know that you're ready for it. Look what it says. I saw coming out of the mouth of the devil, the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast of the Antichrist, out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. I preached a message on that one time. I'd like to preach about those three spirits right now, but I can't. I don't have time. I'll get on it later. For they are demonic spirits. Listen to this. These spirits like unclean frogs, they are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole earth, the whole earth, Africa, Europe, Asia, all over the whole earth, all the continents. These three unclean spirits like frogs are going to be released to the prime ministers, the kings, the queens, all governmental leaders. And the Bible says they're demonic spirits and they'll be performing signs and they will be demonic signs being performed by demonic aliens who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle, that is Armageddon, on the great day of God Almighty. Now I want to talk to you about this real quickly. I'm going to be real careful how I broach this because I don't want anybody leaving out of here and trashing me. Just hear what I'm saying and pray for me. In recent years, there's been an increasing number of astonishing events in our skies right over our heads that suggest that there's powers at work that are not of human intelligence. I think everybody right now agrees to that. I'm not even going to use the word UFO. I'm not even going to use it. Because they may say UFOs and people get all weirded out. No, that's not it. I'm coming from a biblical perspective. But there's astonishing events that's going on now daily over the heads of people all over the world, the nations of the world right now. And these things that's in operation in the atmospheric heavens are not human intelligence. They're not human. They are alien. 
And the governments of this world, especially the American government, have pretty well managed through the last four or five decades, six decades, to squelch any information concerning this phenomenon. They have intimidated, they have locked down under keys, they have, declass they have classified, you can't talk about it, you'll be demoted if you're in the military and you talk about it, but it appears now, all of a sudden now, in these times, right now, the times in which we're living, that it seems like the governments are now loosening up. And now they're realizing they're not able to conceal this anymore. It's too widespread because of increased activity above our heads over all nations. They're all experiencing it. These things are going into the sea and traveling as fast under the sea as they travel above the earth. They're interdimensional beings. So it's not just our government in America, but now it's global governments are now on the verge of openly recognizing the existence of these strange otherworldly sightings. So the globalists seem to believe that these beings, the globalists, I said, the globalists, many of them now, if you begin to listen to them, the smart guys, they're beginning to talk like, well, maybe these beings are going to usher in a period of peace, prosperity, and global unity. But on the other hand, including myself, I don't believe that that's going to happen, but I believe we're about to be handed one of the most bizarre and far-reaching deceptions that mankind has ever known. Much will depend on how you deal with the strange events that may soon take place. You may say, this is crazy, pastor, to be talking about this in church. Really? Really? Let me ask you a question. If we don't talk about it here in this setting, where are you going to hear the truth? Where are you going to hear the truth? Until recently, this kind of talk was relegated to the lunatic fringe and crazy science fiction buffs. But now it has emerged in the mainstream media. Now even Fox News and Tucker Carlson are talking about these things openly without reservation. It has become one of the hottest topics on television. The History Channel now is in its 16th season of presenting programs called Ancient Aliens, and I've watched a good many of them just out of curiosity, and I'm shocked at the spin they're putting on these things. And they're making it look so appealing and that these are friendly spirits and they've come to help us. And these programs are growing by leaps and bounds. The latest one is a thing called Skinwalker Ranch. The secret of Skinwalker Ranch, where they investigate strange anomalies and supernatural phenomena. There's other type documentary programs and information now that's growing in viewership by leaps and bounds. And now the federal government is releasing previously classified information. When President Trump was president, right before he went out of office, he established a COVID relief bill. It was a stimulus bill. It was a government spending bill signed by President Trump. It was $2.3 trillion. And the federal agencies were asked to gather all their information that they have on unidentified aerial phenomenon and to make everything that they know, NASA, the government, CIA, and everybody, make everything that they know about all of this public within 180 days. And that 180 days has not expired yet. So now there's a move on for the CIA, NASA, and the government to declassify everything that's been, de that's been classified to let the American public know everything that the government knows. Why now? Why now? And you know as well as I do, let's be honest, you know as well as I do that the time has come that we know if this is the advent of the Antichrist and the false prophet, they're going to have as their instruments, anything 
that it takes to mesmerize society and populations of the earth for the mass deception that's about to come. You know that. So let's talk about this just for a minute. I want to go back and cover this. I saw something on this I want to look at. I've talked about this for years, but I want to show you something that I think is really interesting that I just saw recently. In Matthew 24, they come to Jesus privately and they said, Jesus, tell us what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. And so Jesus sat down and talked to him. He, he, he just opened up. He opened up. He didn't classify anything. He just opened up, declassified everything. He just talked to him. And here's what he said. We better pay attention to what he said. He said, take heed that no man deceive you. Now, <clears throat> let's stop right there. When he said, take heed that no man deceive you, he was talking to the disciples. He said, you. Twelve of them. Take heed that no man deceive you. So he nailed that down right off the bat. Right after that, he said, Many false prophets shall arise and deceive many. There shall be false Christs, false prophets. They'll show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Let's look at the first stage now. He said they'll deceive you. Let's go back to that and look at it one more time. They'll deceive you. In verse, that was in verse 4, verse 11, he said, this deception is going to grow and expand at a later time, a different millennium. And he said, many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. So at first it was the 12. Now he said in a later millennial shall deceive many. And then he was they asked him the third time. He, he mentioned it the third time. And here's what he said. And this is, this is where I'm coming in right here. This is where I'm stepping in on your life. And I want to remind you what Christ said. He said, in the last days, and I'm going to show, the, show you this in just a minute. In the last days, he said, there will arise false Christs, false prophets, and will show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, and what he's actually saying is, it is possible. It is possible that some people that you really look to and trust and have listened to will fall for this. And he said, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So what he's saying is, deception is going to grow. Let me show it to you right now. I'm going to put it on the screen. Let's look at this. First stage. He said on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him and said, tell us when shall these things be? What will be the sign of your coming into the world? Jesus said, take heed that they deceive you. That was the disciples. Second stage. Nations shall rise against nations. Whoa. Let's stop right there. That had never happened before until the 19th century. There was never a world war until the 19th century. So Jesus said to the disciples, there's going to be false Christs. They're already here. Take heed that they don't deceive you. But he jumped over the 8th century, the 9th century, 10th century, 11th century, 12th century, 13th, 15th, 17th, went to the 19th century. He said, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. That is the 19th century of the world wars. And there's going to be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. And you know as well as I do that earthquakes has jumped tremendously. He said, but, now he said, these are the beginning of sorrows. It's what he said. These are the beginning of sorrows. Look at the next passage. They shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. Up. Oh! What is this? 19th century, the 1940s, the Holocaust. They will deliver you Jews up to be afflicted and kill you, and you'll be hated of all nations for my namesake. That's the Holocaust. At least that's what I believe it to be. Never a time until nation rose against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Holocaust. They're going to deliver you up. They're going to burn you. They're going to gash you. They're going to hate you. All nations will hate you for my namesake. 
And then he said this. Third stage, and this brings us to our time, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold, this is our time of a great falling away. Let me ask you this question. How many of you would disagree that we're living in a time right now of a great falling away? How many of you would believe that? Let me see your hand. Great falling away. Listen, if you don't believe it, I'm in the ministry. I see it. I don't have to be convinced of nothing else. There is a great falling away going on. Pulpits have perverts preaching. Many of them do every Sunday. Many things that's going on in so-called house of God is an abomination to the Lord. And that's what you call a great falling away. You might not want to hear that. And you, if you're watching me on television, you're watching me on live streaming, you might be saying, well, I'm going to stop watching you, John Kilp. That's fine with me too. Just stop watching me. That's fine. I don't, I don't have a problem with it. But I tell you what, one day when I stand before God, my hands will be clean. My hands will be clean. It said, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many will wax cold, but he that endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel shall be preached in all the world for witness to all nations. That's happened in the 21st century because you got all the satellites. I can stand here right now with this little mic right here on my tie, and I can speak live streaming to the nations of the earth with this little microphone right here because of satellites and because of live streaming. I can preach live to people around the world, and I'm preaching to them right now Italy, Singapore, Saudi Arabia, Italy, I'm preaching, India, Great Britain, I'm preaching to all of them right now. I get mail from these places. And the Bible says, the third stage is iniquity is going to abound, love of me is going to waste cold, the gospel is going to be preached in all the world. And then it says, and then shall the end come. Now he said this, but here's what you need to be aware of, that when the gospel is preached around the world, and when there has been this great falling away, just be aware that the man of sin and the false prophet are going to arise, and the man of sin, which will be Satan incarnate, will move into Israel in the rebuilt temple and set himself up in the temple, cause the oblations to cease, and will set himself up in the temple that he's God. And look what it says. Therefore, when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whosoever reads this, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. Let them that's on the housetop not come down and take anything out. In the field, don't go back to get your clothes. Woe to them that was suck in those days. Pray that your flight be not in the winter. For then shall be great tribulation. And listen to this. Such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. There's going to be such a time, such a time, such a time that the world has never seen before. And it said, except those days will be shortened, there will be no flesh able to survive. Except for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Therefore, if any man say, lo, here is Christ, or lo, there is Christ, said, um, there will arise false Christ and false prophets, and they shall show great signs and wonders. And here's what he said again. He said, if it's possible, if it were possible, they, they, that means the false prophet, the Antichrist, these interlopers shall even be able to deceive the very elect. Let me just say this to you. When the Lord said to Adam and Eve, if you eat this tree, you're going to die. That's all he said. Never told him about the temptation. Never told him about this beautiful creature. All the Lord said here is, if it was possible, the very elect would be deceived. Well, Lord, what are you trying to say? He didn't tell us. But I'm here to tell you tonight, as a preacher of the gospel, you're going to have to be sharp as a tack. You can't be lazy. You're going to have to be sharp. You're going to have to know your Bible. You're going to need to be filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You're going to need the baptism of the Holy Spirit like you've never needed the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And you're going to need to have the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Because when you speak in other tongues, you're speaking mysteries. And that's the way you build your inner man, your spirit up. I know some of you have been taught against that. I feel sorry for you because you've been taught against it. 
I can't live without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's going to be such tremendous pressure for you to believe deception that's about to be turned loose on the earth that you can't deny what you're seeing because the false prophet and the Antichrist both will have such power that you won't be able to deny it. You'll see it with your own eyes. And you'll say to yourself, this has to be supernatural. It has to be God. There'll be no room left for doubt. It'll be so convincing. It'll be the greatest of all deceptions. Not just signs, but signs and wonders. And it's going to be so strong, the Bible said, if it's possible, even the elect would succumb and yield to this tremendous deception. So here's what Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 25. Look at this. The only thing he said was, there's going to come a great deception. It's going to be so big, so great, if it was possible, the very elect would be deceived. He didn't give no details, but here's what he said. The only thing he said was a little hint. He said, I have told you this before. But he didn't give details. He just said, I have told you this before. You be ready. When the Lord got ready to send them over on the other side in, in the ship, he said, go over to the other side, but he never told them about the storm. Never told them about the storm. You know what he was saying? If I tell you you're going to the other side, you're going to the other side. And you know what he's saying about all this? Don't be deceived. Know your word. Be led by the Holy Spirit. And when the spirit of truth has come, he'll guide you into all truth. You're not going to have to depend on a man to teach you because not many men's going to teach you. The Holy Spirit will teach you. And the Holy Spirit will let you know. And the Holy Spirit will show you things to come. You'll know. You won't be in the dark. God loves you so much and he loves me so much, he's not going to let us be taken by surprise. But my job is a preacher. My job is a preacher. I'm not a politician. I'm not a politician. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a doctor. I am a preacher. And the Bible said, how shall they hear without a preacher? Come on. Now let me show you something. We know that the COVID spirit brought change and this, everything's still shaking out. But I personally believe that we are being systematically set up for the greatest deception of all times. The introduction to the world, introduction for the world to globally receive the person and the rule of the man of sin, the Antichrist himself. I believe that. It will be the ultimate deception. There will not be another one after this one. This is the last deception. This will be the biggie. It will make the Garden of Eden look like Sunday school picnic lunch. This is the biggie. This is not just some snake. This is Satan himself in the form of his son, the Antichrist, and the false prophet that's ahead of a major, syrupy, deceptive religion that it's going to be hard for people to turn it down. The world will not know it, but it will be Satan's last stand to try to unseat Christ from his messianic rule and his eternal kingdom. It will be the last stand of Satan to usurp all power from Christ. So, that of Christ and false prophet, they're an unholy duo. The first beast rises out of the sea. The second beast rises out of the earth. The first beast out of the sea Water is unstable. There's going to be instability in the nations of the earth. That's, that's the atmosphere that the Antichrist will emerge from. Instability and turmoil. Raging conflicts of races and raging conflicts of nations against nations. Economic disorder, economic failure. All tyrants and all dictators down through the years have traditionally arisen from these very conditions. So the final dictator will arise out of the chaos and civil upheaval. It says 
about the beast that rises up out of the sea, there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Power was given unto him to continue 42 months. That's three and a half years. He opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle in them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. This is tribulation saints. And power was given him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations, and all that dwell upon the earth to worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life, slain from, slain, slain from the foundation of the world. The second beast is out of the earth, not out of the sea. Out of the earth means he comes out of established civil order. He will have a dignity. He will be the product of society. He comes from a time of development and growth. The first beast is political, crowned a king and military sovereign. The second beast is religious, like a lamb. The Bible says, like a lamb. Let me read it to you. I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb. He spake as a dragon, spake like Satan. He exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast, which is the one that came up out of the sea. And he receives a deadly wound and the false prophet has the ability to cause him to be healed. And he'll do great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven. Only one other person in history has ever made fire come down from heaven, that's Elijah. And when Elijah made fire come down from heaven, the Jews converted right there. They left Baalism and they came back to the Lord because Elijah called down fire from heaven. The false prophet will have the ability to be like an Elijah and he'll call down fire from heaven. On the earth in the sight of men and he deceives them, verse 14, that dwells on the earth by means of those miracles which he had the power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. There's going to be great idolatry. There's going to be images and idolatry. They're going to make an image of the beast and this image will actually start speaking and cause as many as not would worship the image of the beast that they should be killed. The false prophet will say, if you don't worship the image of this beast, this idolatry, you'll have to give your life. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. No man can buy nor sell save that he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here's wisdom, 666. So the false prophet calls down fire. He has the authority and the ability by deception, strong deception, to do great deceptive miracles. There will be fascination. The world will be fascinated, especially the youth will be fascinated with his powers of sorcery, his power to manipulate images, idolatry, and idols. So what is the mark of the beast? It's 666. I'm just going to touch on this. I'll get on this again later, but I just want you to listen to this. The mark of the beast is the number 666. Now this thing, whatever it is in the hand and the forehead, whatever it is, it's something that the body is going to try to reject. Look at this scripture. The first went and poured out his vial upon the earth. There fell a noisome and grievous sore upon them which had received the mark of the beast. It said those that received the mark of the beast, a grievous sore broke out on those that had took the mark and upon them which had worshipped his image. When they take that mark and they worship that idol, God, they have a reaction and grievous sores breaks out all over them. There's something that went awry. There's something that the body is alien to the body and the body won't accept it. So at the end of the age, the Antichrist and the false prophet will aid and abet one another. It's not unusual to see politicians and religious work together. The Bible has always painted that picture. If you go back and look, in the days of Moses, it said, the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, said, when Pharaoh shall speak to you, show a miracle for you, you shall say to Aaron, take your rod, cast it before Pharaoh, and it'll become a serpent. Moses and Aaron went in Pharaoh. They did as the Lord commanded, cast down his rod. It became a serpent. Pharaoh called his wise men. Pharaoh had his religious crowd, his religious hierarchy, and they contained sorcerers and magicians of Egypt, 
They did the same thing with their enchantments. They cast down their rods, and their rods also became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed their rod. Let me just say this. In the last days, you, if the Lord allows us to stay here much longer, you're going to start seeing tremendous deceptive miracles in the evil world, but you're also going to see tremendous authentic miracles by God's crowd. Now listen to this. Listen to this. And what the Bible is portraying here is God's power will always win over deceptive power. Always win. So now watch this. In Balak and Balaam, when Balak, king of Moab, sought to destroy Israel, he hired the services of Balaam to curse Israel. And you know he tried to curse Israel, and he said, I can't do it. They're blessed, and I can't curse them. So we see that Balak hired Balaam, which was a religious one that would cast spells. So the political leader chose a religious leader to help him take control of the people. If you go back and look, Absalom went to Ahithophel. When Absalom entered into his revolution to destroy his father, David, he did so first by consulting with Ahithophel for evil God, ungodly knowledge and he needed his counsel to support him and Ahithophel gave him ungodly counsel. So false religious leaders are there to give false counsel to these political leaders but they just don't realize they're getting false counsel. Look at this real quickly. I'm going to give you one more. I could give you more but I'm just going to give you one more. Ahab and Jezebel were only able to do what they did in Israel. Ahab was the leader of Israel and Jezebel was his ungodly wife. They were only able to accomplish what they accomplished with the help of the prophets of Baal. Now I want to close with this. I just want you to listen to me for a minute. This sounds weird. Just listen to me. One of the things that these spirits will be able to do in the last days is what they call shape-shifting. Shape-shifting. What is shape-shifting? A physical Human body can't shape shift. A spirit can. A spirit can shape shift, including an angel. A flesh and bone body cannot shape shift. A spirit can. The Apostle Paul's writing this, talking about shape shifting. And no wonder Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Whoa, stop right there just for a minute. The Apostle Paul the apostle to the Gentiles is writing centuries ago, millennia ago. He's an apostle, a man of the cloth, a man of God, an apostle. And he pins these words, not realizing what all the devil's up to in these last days about shape shifting, how spirits are going to deceive people. He said, No wonder Satan himself transforms himself shapeshifts himself into an angel of light. He can appear. Satan does not appear dark. He does not appear sinister. He does not appear with great horns coming out of his head and curling around. He has the ability to shapeshift and transform himself into an angel of light. And that's why I'm standing here telling you tonight, be aware that we're about to move into one of the greatest deceptive times that's ever been known to mankind. <laughs> You better hear me. Therefore, the Bible says it's no great thing if his ministers also, he's talking about the devil's ministers. Who are they? They're among us right now. That it's no great thing if his ministers, Satan's ministers, also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness. What? What? It's no great thing if his ministers, Satan's ministers, transform, shape shifts them things into ministers of righteousness. Are you kidding me? That's what Paul said. Whose end will be according to their flesh, or according to their works. Shape shifting. Shape, what is shape shifting? It's a spirit taking on another form right in front of your eyes. 
That's why the false prophet will be one to do shape shifting and he'll look like a, a normal person operating out of a governmental center. And the next news you know, he's doing great signs and wonders and he's shape shifting into something else totally. Right before the eyes of the public. And the public will be mesmerized. Are you, whoa. A spirit can shape shift and take on another form. A body can't, but a spirit can. Look at this. Hebrews 13, 2. It says, don't be forgetful to entertain strangers because sometime you've entertained strangers, angels unaware, thinking they was the stranger. You know what that means? It means that an angel can shift and transform himself to look like a human being, but he's really an angel. Y'all listening to me? Now come on, listen to me. It means the writer of Hebrews, which is anonymous, said, don't be forgetful to entertain strangers because some have entertained angels unaware thinking they were human strangers. Listen to this. You remember Lot? I'm going over. Is this okay? Is this good? You remember Lot? Those angels came into town. And the angels came into town. They didn't have 12-foot wings. They looked like humans. They had on a pair of pants, a robe or something. They had on something. They came in. They looked like normal human beings. <laughs> they looked like normal human beings. And the Bible says when the Sodomites saw those angels, they lusted after them. They were able to take on a form that was manly, and those homosexuals lusted after those angels. But in an instant, those angels could have shifted into 12-foot wings and 30-foot angels and, you know, whoa! That's the kindest thing that's going to be happening in the last days before the eyes of nations. It will be an all-out, an all-out, all, nothing held back. The devil's going to bring out his, all his trump cards to convince the world that he's greater than Jesus Christ. I've got news for him. Ha, ha, ha. Our God is an awesome God. Come on, give him praise. Let me, let me finish. I just, have, I just have five minutes. Let me finish. Jesus shape-shifted. You don't let that spook you, but he did. Jesus shape-shifted. What do I mean by that? Jesus came into our sphere. He was always with the Father. He was there when the Father made man. Jesus picked up a body, was born in a manger. They killed him. He resurrected, and as soon as he resurrected and he got his resurrected body, first thing Martha saw him, Mary saw him, and she said, she supposed him to be the gardener, didn't even recognize him. On the road to Emmaus, look at this now. This is in the King James Version. It came to pass while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus drew near with, and went with them, and their eyes were holding that they should not know him. And while he was walking with them, the Bible said he took on another form while he was walking with them. Look at that. That's in your King James Version. Look at it. Mark 16. Now, this is about Jesus. This is in your Bible, your King James Version. After that, he appeared in another form unto those on the road to Emmaus as they walked and went into the country. He appeared in another form. You know why? Because now he's a spirit. Listen to this. Y'all hear me? In the book of Revelation, John's there. John the Revelator, he looks at him, he says, oh my God, he's a lamb. Then he looks at him again, he says, oh my God, he's a lion. Who is he? Is he a lamb or is he a lion? It's because he's a spirit. And see, I know it is. Amen. <laughs> 
I like Burke. I like having old Burke around. <laughs> Listen to this. When Jesus comes back, you see, when he came the first time, <laughs> he looked like a little old frail guy. But oh my God, have you seen him on that white horse lately? I said, have you seen him on the white horse? He's not a lowly Galilean. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he's riding on a white horse. Come on, give him praise, somebody. Be seated. I'm still not through. I got to get this done. I got to get it done. I'm almost through. Almost through. But watch this now. You remember when Jesus resurrected and she thought he was a gardener? Oh, you're Jesus. See? And then he said, go tell my disciples and Peter, I'm risen from the dead. And he said, go tell them to meet me. I want to meet with them and I want to talk with them. Well, when he met with them, what did he do? He walked right through the wall. If I was Thomas right there, I'd have said, I'm convinced. <laughs> yep. I'm convinced. The Lord said, here, no, I don't need to touch. No, no, no I'm done. I'm, I'm finished. I'm, I'm done. I'm going to be crucified upside down. I ain't going to be crucified like you. Amen. You see what I'm saying? But look here. The Lord just walked through the wall. But listen to me. When the Lord Jesus comes back, the Bible said that he will destroy the Antichrist and the false prophet. And when he comes back with the saints of God behind him, the saints of God don't lift a weapon. We don't even have a weapon. He didn't even offer us a weapon. You know why? Because he's well able to take care of whatever needs to be done. And he comes back and here's the Antichrist with all of his generals and majors and colonels. And they're all out there and they're gathered in Armageddon. And the Bible said, listen to this. The Bible said, the brightness of his coming is so overwhelming that their eyes melt out of their sockets. When they see Jesus, their eyes will melt out of their sockets and they'll collapse like wax figures on the battlefield. <laughs> Stand to your feet, let's praise him. Come on. Woo! Come on, lift up your hands and praise him. 